this is going to be a roundtable discussion. Um, I will. I'll start by giving a little introduction to what we're going to be talking about. Um, so, a little communication goes a long way. Uh, as an organizer, whatever you put out about your game or your community will be scrutinized, interpreted by players, passed along in a game of telephone that can easily go awry. Uh, in this round table, it is a round table, so we're not just pushing information this way. Information can flow freely around the room. Um, uh, in this round table, we're going to talk about best practices for communicating about your LARP, setting expectations with an eye for heading off controversy of the past. Uh, better communication can also help participants make informed decisions regarding the offered experience. Um, so, uh, do you all want to introduce yourselves? Sure. I'm uh, Lizzie Stark. I am. Uh, I have a journalist life, uh, as well as a LARP life. So I'm a, a writer for a living, um, and I, I think that that's my place on this panel is to be the uh, the journalist. Uh, my name is Derek Pilsen. I run a large company called Participation Design Agency. We do large, we do consultancy for any participatory event or exhibition and so on. Um, we run labs for Whiteboard and we are doing our own large scale productions. The one we do right now is, is inside Hamlet, of course. Uh, there's no tickets. <laughs> <laughs> You've mentioned that before. Right? Yes, I have. <laughs> yes. My name is Jason Morningstar. Uh, I'm a full-time game designer, and I am uh, probably here in relation to uh, LARP Shack, which is a locomore LARP community that I am the co-founder of. Uh, and I'm here. I'm here to moderate. Um, <laughs> so one of the ways we thought we might start this is just by kind of taking a temperature of the room uh, and see if we have a, a few topics that we have discussed in advance, but to see like if there's anything in particular that the whole group is super interested in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through, I have a lot of them, but I'm going to just go through some of them. And if folks could be like not interested at all, hands down, a little interested, number one, medium interested, number two, extremely interested, number three. And then I will get a count, and then we'll start with the highest number and see where that takes us. Um, so cool. So uh, the first topic, uh, no, so it's not to talk about, it's a gauge. Uh, the, the concept of like documentation, like pre-game documentation, and avoiding uh, communication mishaps up front. Can we vote too? Yeah. It's it's round. Round. The table is round, so I see three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-two. 18, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm gonna That's okay. You're doing a great job. I was doing a really great job. I'm all sorry. Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's been a little while since we had a great job. Oh, oh <laughs> See, I was mad at you for a second. Negative <laughs> 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 two, man. The technical stuff's getting better and better. It's getting awesome. That's a great story. So, do we have a couple of topics about engagement, about community engagement? So, one of them is like the idea of online engagement and communication that way. Oh, we should be focusing on voting right now. Um, what? Do I, you don't have to, you just don't get the Online, state, pre, any time, just um, Yeah, in general, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 17, 17, great, great. Um, do we want to maybe share some epic tales of communication failures? Is that something anybody is interested in? <laughs> Say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, okay. Um, so the concept of uh, uh, communication infrastructure, um, so like things you do organizationally behind the scenes to facilitate communication. So there's a there's a, a two-fold thing here. Maybe they're the same, maybe they're not. If you think they're not, then let me know. But the idea of identifying incipient communication failures and avoiding or mitigating shit storms. <laughs> <laughs> 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. More chocolate for Mari. I know. Just six, okay? Holy cow! That was a panel earlier. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
make sure that, that you are clean all the time. Maybe you should take showers more than once a day. Um, there will be shouting, you, you will be shouted at, and people, you will shout at people as well. So there's like everything, you will eat vegan food, uh, you will have three meals a day, and so on. So it's everything from, from food to the interactions that you're going to do. And then you can sort of say, well, um, maybe I'm not in, into this. What What's the next thing? Okay, the witches get up at six, they do a lot of boring menial tasks, and so on. And then you can sort of hop into the specific parts of the life, or you can do one that just covers everything in the life, and by that, it encourages people to, to opt out and say, maybe this game is not for you, and be like very upfront that you don't want it. Well. And content warnings work that way. You think about a large factory where there's a back box, so <laughs> these things the game's definitely going to cover. Uh, and if those are not for you, you can't really engage with the game, you should pick something different. And the more you can refine that format to be easy to grasp intuitively through website design or even graphic design, the more success you're going to have. So I think that the um, uh, the hashtag feminism collection did a good job of this because we had a really amazing graphic designer <clears throat> way above our, our pay grade, but um, she developed the teardrop system for intensity that was very helpful. And she also uh, developed like the short information um, uh, which was uh, included like how much time it takes, how many people you need, what kind of supplies you need, and what the um, kind of like what the con what the content of the game was. Um, and that is useful not just in the case of this particular collection. That's useful not just for players, but also for the people who are going to be facilitating the um, the games. We use the teardrop system at Lark Shack as well, and it's very successful on a social level. And it's really especially delightful because people will argue about it once they get a little bit of fluency in the games. It's really nice. Oh well, yeah, and the name of the woman who created that system is Shul Men, uh, who's out of from the West Coast. Uh, are there any techniques for games that are uh, more player driven in their content? So you as an organizer might not have control over this is what you do at 7 a.m., this is what you do at 8 a.m. Uh, Anything that we that any team has never necessarily used for anything we've employed in terms of expectation management or workshopping for yeah. like for uh, longer games that uh, you can model the behavior you want to see and set expectations pretty clearly with uh, thoughtful workshop. That's one of them. Yeah, so there's the pre thing which is often written down on the website uh, or maybe do a video or something where you get people to opt out when they, when they are when they come to you. To the game, and they want to participate. Then there's like a calibration phase where you try to get everybody on the same page. And, and verbally, you 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 listen. To, you, you obtain information very differently when you're listening to something, or if you're embodying it and moving around and practicing it. So that's a way of, of one gaining trust among the participants, so they know where the boundaries are, both for themselves and others. But it's also a way of getting everybody to move in the same direction. Uh, I don't know if that's expectation management because it's a little bit late in the game right now. But I have games where people go through that market and say, sorry, it's not for me, and then they, they leave, which is perfectly fine. We don't want people there that, that are there just because they make an investment, but we want them there because they feel they can contribute and learn something. Also, if you know that you're not going to have control over the content, I mean, to a certain extent. We know our designer or creator has control over what happens in the game. That's the whole thing. You can say goodbye. It's exciting. Um, you can just be transparent about uh, the extent to which you are able to control the content. Um, or if there's a hot button topic you definitely want omitted, you can you can state that. Uh, I think this is when uh, having uh, like some policies and procedures can help you. Um, you can't control the content, but you can let people know that there are going to be tools used to calibrate, and, uh, and you can let people know uh, what your LARP is emphatically not playing with. For example, like if I show up to uh, Karen Edmonds LARP, um, I know people are going to be shouting at me, but are they going to be shouting racial epithets? For example, that would be something I might want to know. Um, Lizzie, before you talk a little bit about how you can gauge uh, expectation manager one way is through like uh, your player anxiety leading up to an event, um, what are some other ways uh, to kind of 
continue to take that temperature. I, not only have I maybe set the expectations very clearly on my website or in some other communication, but those expectations are still in line as you're leading up to the event, and even including uh, on site at the event. I think leading up to the event, you want to have some kind of um, <clears throat> locked, not locked, but like clear way for the participants to contact you that's just on one channel. So, for example, uh, here at Living Games, we're connecting with a lot of people through the Slack. Um, if you ask a question on the Facebook forum, often the answer is go to the Slack. And this uh, minimizes the labor of organizers because you only have to check one channel. Um, so to have a channel you can control and to make it very clear to the participants how they can reach you if they, if they do have anxieties. But I think it's very hard to get, um, like the, one of the natural answers would be, well, you ask your participants and then they tell you, but they will not return your emails. So that's not a good thing. Or they might not even know. Right? They might not know that their expectations are straight away from ours. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, anything else on that, on um, ways to check in with your player base or your community leading up to that? Something that, uh, that I think is very, uh, very useful when you have it is it's a kind of a kind of a blessing is for competency. If you have enough people that are part of the community that can do some of that work for you, I think that's enormously beneficial. And of course that depends on your circumstances. But if you have it, I think you can you can um, you can break that. I was gonna say you can rely on it, but that's not yeah. I just want to ask something. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, you know, when my show is mixed with universal uh, theater and some type of LARPs and, and everything like that, um, and we got people who are non LARPers coming through, um, but what we attracted immediately was escape room people because it kind of looks like our thing's an escape room, and they immediately hated it, oh. you know, what I mean? because it's not an escape room. So, uh, it, um, we learned that very quickly. So, uh, my recommendation for everybody is that if you, if you Really do something that makes people like not happy because escape room people are like, well, this is an escape room. How wrong is that, right? Um, but what we did was we talked to the escape room experts and we said, how can we make these people at least feel better about this situation? And he said very simply, yeah, tell them it's not an escape room, number one. Because they already did bought tickets too late, they're messing, right? Um, and help guide them towards that. So, like, you need to participate with our actors, you need to talk to them, they're not just a prop. And that kind of alleviated some of the pain from then on um, after that initial harumph type stuff. Yeah, and, and that reminds me of the arc of what you were saying before about part of the expectation management is, is this curation almost, right? Um, so would you mind expanding a little bit on that? Uh, yeah, well. so um, you really don't want everybody at your thing, especially if it has like strong themes or there's specific things that you have to go through. Maybe focus on on, on the thing that some people have trauma uh, with and so on. And then you don't want those people there because they will generate, not only will they have a really horrible time because you're probably gonna trigger them, but they will also take up so much time and emotional bandwidth from the organizer that you can't run your game because somebody who is having a panic attack in the middle of the game. So it's not beneficial for you that they bought a ticket because that's it's, it's going to be way too expensive for you to have them there. Uh, and I think we just have to realize that not all labs are for everybody and there's not room for everybody. For example, that inside Hamlet, the question we needed to ask very early on is that if we do it at Castle Elsinore, which is 400 years old, we will not be able to have anybody. Uh, who is in a wheelchair there because there's no lifts, there's no nothing, there's old stone uh, spiral staircases. And then you need to put on the website, we're very sorry, this is no castle. If you can't walk up and down those stairs a lot, we can, you, you will have a really bad time. Uh, so we're very sorry, but that's just the way it is. And some of the stuff you can control, and some of the stuff you cannot control. And then you, you really need to realize uh, what what parts of these things you can control and which you should change them, right? Um, but you should also be ready to get critiqued for that, right? And you need to have good answers ready. I think uh, like a, a 
use the word that nobody said yet, that should be said, is transparency. You need to have transparency about the content of the, of the game and transparency about uh, what services you're offering and what services you are unable to offer. Um, this is a problem in a lot of, uh, at a lot of gaming events where I say, I will provide food. Uh, well, what does that mean? Um, uh, what if I'm not able to provide? Uh, what if I'm not able to provide food free food? That needs to be clear so that people who need food free food can either make their own arrangements or contact you. Uh, I just want to add something to the mix, and that is the large community, gaming or gamers in general, a lot of really smart, clever people. Expectation management is not the place to get clever. Mm -hmm. I've read plenty of game materials, promotion materials, blurbs, and so forth. Where they're really like clever and subtle ways of projecting, like calling out names of other marks or calling up names of like media uh, uh, properties or using verse or rhyme or so many other like really like fascinating clever ways of advertising your game, and those will not land with people enough to have someone who doesn't know what's going on opt out. So like just beware being too clever in this section. And are there any techniques that are particularly useful for setting expectations of someone who doesn't have a background in LARP? Well, it, <clears throat> that is super difficult because yeah. I think LARP in general, we're very good at communicating to the subculture, but it has sort of a, its own inherent language, the way that you talk about it and so on. And if you don't understand the references, then it's almost impossible to step into that world unless you have like a like a guide that's going to help you, or you are like super motivated. Um, and and I, I don't have a clear answer for that, but we're working very hard on figuring that out. Uh, but it is very, very difficult. Because if we, if you, if you, if the text is pointing to somebody who has never been there, it sort of talks down to people who have done it a lot. Um, so maybe give information differently to different groups of people. So also it's a, a back to it being a semantic problem. I mean the, the word LARP itself is a little problematic, but it also is the, the clearest gateway in finding more information about what it is. Mm -hmm. So by avoiding that by calling it something that may be just as accurate but but it's, that doesn't include that word, it will make it harder for someone to, to become educated about it on their own. And that's a, it's a mixed bag. I mean I, I don't I don't know necessarily that um, I don't think obfuscating the term is the right thing to do, but I wish that we could transition gracefully to something that was more uh, user friendly. I think uh, this goes to avoiding jargon. Um, jargon reads great to in groups, it doesn't read well to out groups. So you can obey the uh, journalist rule um, for jargon, which is you're allowed to introduce it sparingly, only when it's needed, and you explain what the word means the first time. Um, and there are a lot of places now on the internet that explain many of these terms. We've got the Nordic Lark Wiki, um, for example, and you can do a lot of linking for people who need the deep dive. Um, can, I, can I follow up with a, what, do you, what happens when you think you're being clear about what you're saying and what the participants are hearing is not what you're saying? So for example, in a, uh, you said we will have gluten. You, if you are gluten free, there will be food you can eat, right? And they get there, and it's like I can eat salad and this other thing, and it's like I, my choices are very small. Now there was food I could eat, right there, and then they, then there's a there's demand thing, or it's a vegan menu, and you're like, but I can go get meat, <laughs> right? And the thing, and so they're not quite hearing what you're saying, and I I don't know if there's a solution to that, but I think because particularly people even have notions of what LARP is. They see LARP and they think X, and then they show up at events, and it's Y. Um, I don't, I don't know how to help that. I almost feel like the ingredient thing that you mentioned earlier is how you really get at it. Like, um, I've been running into in past events. Like, I feel like some of our uh, problems that we run into uh, with getting people in is one thing we get often is like, you guys are charging too much. Like, I'd love to go to your thing, but it's too expensive. And I'm like, because right. I'm feeding you yeah. a really nice meal 
in a really nice location. Yeah. And then, and I'm trying to get my pricing down on that as much as I can, but like I'm limited to what my caterer is willing to do, right? Um, and so I picked up from that, hey, Athena, you haven't been putting your menu on the ticket site, oh right? Like that alone would help somebody be like, oh, I'm having steak, right? Or answer the gluten-free. Like if I, if I provide the menu of everything that's gonna be available, they can immediately look at it and say, do I have vegan options? Do I have vegetarian options? Do I have meat options, right? Like what is going to be available to me now that I know that, now I know. And then even you know, put on there like is, there was another thing I ran into that um, like one of our events didn't start till 8 p.m. And so we had people who decided to come stay and so they showed up at three and they're slightly outside of the city. They're actually still in a town, but they thought because I'm not in Boston, I can't use Grubhub to get delivery food. And so I just feel like I can't get food until <laughs> eight o'clock and now I'm starving. And so they send me a message and they're like, I, if this was nice and everything, but I was starving because food didn't get served until eight and we're not, there's no restaurants within my visibility. So I assume there's no food anywhere. And I'm like, but the food was like this far away from you and it's literally like around the block, right? And so I realized like I have to provide that information and say like there are also these options if you need additional food, right? Like, yeah. I, think, I think that goes to, to the information prioritization. Like yeah. some people just need to know that there will be food. That right. is the message that everybody needs to know. But then but anyway, food is food is a good example because it's always just always so, so great. So fresh. Um, yeah, and so you can get more granular, um, which is where and this is very dull, but the formatting on your website really helps you. Okay. Uh, headings and bolding and bullet points um, and all of these tricks for uh, making sure that people get the most important message. Yeah, and if we look at food. Um, we tend to be, I, I wouldn't say rude about it, but maybe a little bit just having a special menu for two people and then the, the other hundred have the, 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 the regular menu. Those two things demand equal amount of work. Mm -hmm. and this, the, the amount of hours that to be worked on is exactly the same for two and one hundred people. And as we know with food, people have many, many different uh, there's many disabilities, there's many allergies, and so on, and that generate maybe need like 35 different menus to be able to accommodate everybody. And often we say we can provide these exact things, and there's going to be this exact in the, in the, in the meals, and you're going to get them this day. then and then. Everything else we cannot help you with. We will have like cooling space, or this this phone number you can call for this restaurant, or, or whatnot. So on. So you give options. You tell them beforehand, so they, they will get disappointed. But then you'll help them get over that disappointment. If they don't want to get over that disappointment, uh, you don't want them there because then they will be more. They will take up more energy than your time for that. Point. So so you you really want to include everybody, but there's not capacity for it and you just have to realize that so you don't burn out over stuff like that you'd rather use that time to make a better lot so. were you raising your hand any uh, i mean yeah it was, uh it's all about information i guess right sharing information and what Maurice said is there's people who will not get it you know like my show starts at five it can't help them. that's it and i have people showing up at 3 30 and they're like we're here for the show I'm like, what time is the show? I'm like, I'm like five. Mm -hmm. So, or where's the like, show? Where, where do we sit? And I'm like, there's nowhere for you to sit. The show's going on with other people. You know what I mean? So, like, some people won't get it, but I, I add a, a thing. It's like, there's nowhere to sit, so don't come early. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you, can't, you can't please everybody, but, you know, then I still have people spread up, so I don't have them. I think with time. Like, it sometimes is good to lie to your participants about when things start and just say that they start um, half an hour earlier than they do because uh, we all know that there are some people who are just chronically late. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious if where the exceptions lie to the golden rule of transparency. Mm. Well, it's one. You mm. lie about the start time. Yeah, lie about the start time. Uh, you can't be transparent about some safety concerns. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. 
like uh, if wanna... you like a safety report, if somebody makes oh. a safety report to you yes. and like you have to uh, eject somebody for the game from the game, you can't give full information about it because that would make safety reporting not safe yes. mm -hmm. uh, for anybody who's reporting. So I think that's another. You might not want to get into the details of like your arrangements with the venue. Uh, yeah, often I would. Sometimes uh, participants come up to me and say, so the ticket costs this, what do I actually get for my money? You know, they want like a breakdown of budget or something like that. You know, and I, I, the answer I give it, you get it, if it's before the thing, I say, you're going to get a great, great life. <laughs> That's what you're going to get. For money. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not willing to discuss with my why I've made certain choices. I, I, sometimes they come afterwards and want to see the budget. Mm -hmm. And I said, did you just get a great game? And then they say, yes. So maybe they say, you're the shit. And they, I'm so sorry about that, but mm -hmm. that's what you got. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, so often it's about phrasing stuff in a way that is not up for debate. Uh -huh. uh, and I do that a lot, a lot, a lot. Because it's not up for debate. It's not like when you go to the movies and you think it's shitty. You're not going to call off Steven Spielberg and say, what the fuck, right? Even though we should. Sometimes we should. But it's about closing it down before it starts. Yeah. It's not a dialogue. Even though that we're collaborating on creating this lab together, the intricate details of why the choices have been made in the design phase and production phase, it's not something that the participants should, uh, should step into a discussion about. Mm -hmm. Then they can go to a different lot if they are not dissatisfied or maybe make, make, make their own. Exactly. Of course, if you made a mistake, you want to know that. So it's a case by case basis. How do you how do you do that? How do you uh, try not to lose? I'm very bad at not um, trying to raise you people. I do a little uh, for nine women are upset. Do you lose tips? I say thank you for the feedback, uh, but it's not something that we we'll discuss right now. Mm -hmm. And then they say, but it's just the way it's going to be. I'm going to send to you. I'll tell you now. I think it's about owning the note. But with that also comes a lot of responsibility. If you have made a mistake, then you absolutely need to apologize, right? But but in the moment, it's, it's not up to debate at all. I just want to add something from a panel earlier today or yesterday about safety and consent and LARPs is we all sort of like double down on the idea of like having somebody available to talk about certain things. And part of that, that we didn't really discuss out loud is not having everybody available to talk about everything at all times. So like if you're the head organizer for a 200 person event, you can't address everyone's questions. So one answer I think is, have someone else available. Somebody, maybe a volunteer, maybe somebody who does not have a lot of other responsibilities, who can just engage with people. And that person, it turns out, can legitimately say, I really don't know yeah. to a lot of things. Um, but delegating that responsibility to answer questions, I think, can can be really helpful. There's, there's the, the, the flip side of being able to say no, like, look, we're not going to discuss this all that. A lot of times, if people are complaining, all they really need is to have somebody listen and say, I hear you, I understand where you're coming from, you can't do anything about it. And as an organizer, you may not have the time or the space to be able to do that. So if you, if you have to, you can just say, no, we're not discussing it, we can talk about it later. If you have somebody else who you can designate, who can just take them aside and sit down with them and just listen to them for 20 minutes and say, yes, that's terrible, yes, that shouldn't have happened, mm -hmm. yes, that's um, you know, we can't do anything, I'm very sorry about that. It can often solve the problem just by having somebody yeah. there, even though they're, they're still saying no, but they're providing that space where somebody can basically work through their issue for themselves. And that speaks to having a really clear channel for communication. Like if you have to pick one thing to be transparent about, I think that would be a very that would be a very yeah. respectable choice. And so a really clear channel of communication, not just before the LARP happens, but also during the LARP. Sometimes people have great uh, pre-game communication, but then uh, you show up to their event and it's hard to know and get in touch with them if something is uh, not right. And this also speaks to, to uh, developing and, and managing your team, right? Because there are people who are extraordinarily good 
and, and listening and reflecting and being a, a, a sort of a, a base and doing that emotional labor as sort of their job. And they're people who suck at it. <laughs> so, so um, curating the group of people that you're going to be doing these events with is important. I also just want to say that I think yeah, doing that emotional labor is also a really, really exhausting skill. So uh, I think there should be a community custom of buying beverages uh, from people on the safety committee, and I just want to take that advantage. Of <laughs> <laughs> All right, so maybe switching a little bit of gears to the infrastructure notion that you just brought up. Um, I know you mentioned before that Slack is a tool that we're using here. Are there any other tools uh, that you see that have been useful for managing the, the channel of communication? I think the tool is not as important as being really clear about what the tool is and not having five tools, having one tool, because you don't want to be checking five tools. So uh, at a buffer alert, for example, weekend buffer alert, it could be as simple as having like a whiteboard on the wall somewhere where people can write their concerns. It might be as simple as having like a somebody that you could go to in a sanctuary space uh, here at a large event right there are specialized ways to have those channels of communication um uh, code of conduct, code of conduct. Uh, having that written into the code of conduct so for example at lark shack the monthly meetup that i am co-runner of we make it very clear in our code of conduct that myself and kate hill are the people you talk to if you have an issue and we will address it and that's just the way it is and that's been very effective for us on a small scale, that's not going to scale, but when we have less than 20 people in every meetup, it's great. It works perfect. Yeah. Code of conduct is important and also strategies of conflict. So if somebody, if something happens, and no matter what it is, if you have way before the your event, uh, you have written down what you'll do in that situation. And of course, you can't cover everything, but you can maybe do it for like five or ten things. Because when you're running it, your bandwidth of making smart decisions is very low. Uh, or it's, it's not there at all because there's all the other stuff that's gone wrong. Then you can go and look at the paper and say, this is what we're going to do. And maybe you're not even in the room and then somebody will go out there and they can do that, right? So, and then you can take responsibility and say, okay, we did not follow this or we did follow this. And then you can be smart about it. So it's a, bit, it's a very good way of, of of sort of optimizing your damage control when you're there. And by the same token, also having a channel of communication back to the participants. This is usually quite easy. Uh, if you're organizing a LARP, you walk into the, um, mm -hmm. the room where everybody would be, you do this, uh, or whatever. Um, but if you do need to make an official <coughs> state about, statement about something, having like a, posting it on your website and not like in a, Facebook comments to whoever was upset. You mean making sure it's not ephemeral and it's not personal? Yeah, make, making sure that it's like, uh, uh, that it's in a place where everybody can access. I think there was a question. Where it's clear it comes from. John, you? Um, yeah, a, a bit bridging this topic in the last one. Um, uh, completely invaluable role that Laura 47 Boylan paid, played for the JAL core ops team is that she answered our email, the point of contact email, and uh, simple stuff she didn't answer to. She dealt with entirely out of our view, and when she had a question, she came to us, so we didn't have to check email endlessly. And that was, I never want to organize another event where someone doesn't do that for me. Mm -hmm. I'd also suggest setting up your feedback surveys before your event. Word. So that yeah. they just go out after, because mm -hmm. I know I'm personally guilty of not getting ones out afterwards because I'm just, after you're done, you're exhausted mentally, and you're like, I can't imagine taking time to set this up now. Um, so it's easier to just do that pre game and then it just goes out there. Really and while people are still thinking about it, it's fresh on their minds. Strategy I've often used, not as much now because I, I sort of know how much work I can do, but I think. The, the thing I've used is that I have a person that has nothing to do with the LARP that arrived when the LARP is being set up and their sole responsibility <coughs> is to take care of the organizers mm -hmm. and they overrule you in like when you go to bed or when you leave. <laughs> and then you know they give back up so they, they leave you the most stress or they say you've been up for 26 hours you will go to bed now because you make sh you really want this thing to be as best as possible and you will make shitty choices to get there. Uh, so having somebody there that can overrule the stupidity of that is, is very useful. I like my mom too. 
<laughs> Going back to the feedback form as well, uh, I think it's really smart to have a feedback form because uh, if people want to complain, again, you're giving them a channel where they can complain to you, ideally instead of starting an internet shitstorm. Because if you don't give them an outlet, they will find another place to have it. I don't think you can ever eliminate, like, of course, all the lovely social media posts that are often quite enjoyable to read as a professor. Um, but, uh, but maybe you can help. I like to think you can help just take the edge off some of the, the rougher stuff. Um, so what's a way to be able to identify when like a miscommunication is building towards a communication failure and eventually, hopefully not, but towards a shit score? What are, what are signs to look for so you can find that early if possible? Well, I think I mean, I think you can try to gain, look at your mark and think about the typical things that, that get people upset, which are usually uh, race, class, gender, food sleeping, food sleeping. Um, and but then the thing about a shit storm is that usually it just it just comes out of nowhere. <laughs> you don't notice the dark cloud until it is upon you, um, or until the comment thread is a hundred deep. I've been, I think I've been very fortunate with having little to non strict starts around my labs, which I'm very grateful for. Um, I've, I've been trying to sort of analyze why that is, and I think it's about very clear communication and a great skill of saying no early. The earlier, the better, and not trying to trying to go into a dialogue about everything because it will take up so much of your time. It will also stop a lot of people from playing the games and maybe you'll gain some enemies on the way, but uh, I think it's worth it because we want to do large speed. And I think that comes with lab making is that you also turn into a community manager, whether you like it or not, there's no way around that. And, and, and that very quickly becomes like the main thing that you do. Um, and you very early on need to build a culture because if you don't if you don't build that culture then your participant will build it for you and it will probably be horrible <laughs> because stuff consensus consensus stuff in that scale never really works so you really need to make sure that it, it is controlled very early on and that there's some things that cannot be debated and something that's that's not room for in this and, and that you will put your foot down and say this is unacceptable behavior very early on uh, and that is hard in the beginning, but it has a massive payoff at the end. I'm going to push back on that a little bit in, in that I don't know that we certainly can't control how culture is created. We can we can model good behavior, we can set standards, but uh, a, a group is going to create their own culture ultimately. And uh, sometimes it goes in directions that we, we don't like and we need to course correct for. Uh, would you agree with that? Well, yeah, you can't control everything, but if you if you sort of enforce that uh, that the person responsible for the person for the person responsible for your experience is you, nobody else, and that you need to make an effort to make sure you get the the, the experience that you want, and if, if you can't get that experience within that framework of of the life, then you should do something else. Um, I, I've seen uh, many large cultures where there's some sort of inherent uh, demand from the participants to help you with everything as a, as a participant. And, and no matter what it is or what drive you have, that they must fix it or they are assholes. You know, that's yeah. that's just the risk of the design. So, yeah, it has to be done. You have to show people that they need to take responsibility for it. The other piece to that, I think, is that you need to curate your community, right? Your community manager or community organizer, then there's you have some responsibility for sending people to corn table. They need to go to the corn table, you know, and <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> Send us to. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, that takes some moral courage, and it's always ugly and stupid. But yeah. I think it just has to be done, and you need to be prepared to do that, or it'll the community will eat itself. I, I would like to chime in on that if you don't mind, because um, a lot of times in attempting to be accommodating and understanding to the thing, you give and you give a little bit, and then they they begin to think that they now have a way to push further and further and further. Um, 
and that can actually backfire in a way. I mean, I've learned that the really, the really, <laughs> the really, really hard way. Um, which was, oh, well, that part of it's reasonable. Let me, you know, let me see if I can do this part of it. And then next thing you know, the expectation is that then I can push and push and push on these other things um, to where it's it's completely unreasonable. But if you had just said no from the start, um, we wouldn't have necessarily gotten there. I wonder if maybe like I don't know, this was just the thing that popped into my head from like business management thoughts, right? So like a well a well managed company usually has like a value statement, mm -hmm. right? That the entire company can go around and it and it speaks to your employee culture, it speaks to the people that, that you want to bring into your company, the kind of things you want to create. And I almost wonder if like each of our large communities would benefit from that. Like I've had I've been in some really great large communities where it's really clear because they have a statement that I'm like I read that, I know exactly what to expect out of this community that might be different from this other community who has this other goal or statement or whatever. And I think you know, maybe being able to set up something like that that says like, these are the values, these are the type of uh, experiences you're gonna have, these are the kind of people you're gonna play with. And so if I look at that and I go, that's not me, I know what to walk away, right? There's just a semantic problem. Like if you say, so for example, if you use the word inclusive, that inclusive community. Yeah. Right? Now you have set up this expectation that means many different things. So right. For some people, inclusive will then be anyone and everyone, and you will do whatever it takes to. Um, and it's like, as John Stavropoulos often yeah. says, the first question you should ask about inclusive space is inclusive for who? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's a bad actor who took that as an opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, if we take like one step further back, at least if you look at, at the community where. Where, I, where I'm a part of is that there are certain economies for doing stuff that will reflect upon the community that you create. So if you, if you as a large designer know there's like three, at least in my community, there are three things that 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 is part of the economy. One is, is money. You do something and you get paid for it. The second one is that you get some sort of status, fame or whatever. And then there's drama. That is the third economy. And, and that can be exchange into status in my community. It's not as much as, let's say, five or 10 years ago, but if you are the artist that gave up, gave up everything for the LARP and you lost your relationship and maybe your job, then you're cool because you, you, have, you have suffered for your art. And that, that, and, if, if, and that will translate into the culture as well. So if you're participants, then suddenly drama becomes a driving force to gain status as a participant and so on. And that will just destroy communities very fast. And it's it's way better now than it's been three years. So hopefully it will go in the right direction. I think the reason that is that there, now there's more people are actually getting paid. And when you're getting paid, you don't have time for drama, right? So <laughs> you're not getting paid a lot, but at least there's enough to keep the drama there. So, um, okay, so we've talked a little bit about leading up to the Red Edge Shift Farm. Once the Shift Farm has happened, uh, what tech, what have we seen that is good for mitigating that and, and process? Unable to avoid them, they're happening. What do you think, Lizzie? <laughs> yeah, so many things. I think that um, you can only control the message on platforms that you control. So you should try to answer them on the platforms that you control. Uh, if somebody writes a mean comment on something I've written, like in my journalist life, and that has happened to me uh, many times, um, I don't feed the trolls in the comments. The answer might be to write another piece on a good platform that addresses that. Um, huh. uh, because you end up spending a lot of emotional labor in the weeds at trying to debate every point. Um, Do you acknowledge you it? Acknowledge Do you say, like, thanks for your thoughts? <coughs> no, I, would, I say no response. Uh, I had a piece that I wrote about my mastectomy that went to, like, I think 200 comments when it went live, and people were calling me, uh, uh, it, it was really unfortunate. People were calling me crazy and dumb and saying that I would have brain surgery if I had a risk of brain cancer. and then, we proved Godwin's law in like 40 comments. I mean, yeah. people told me I was a terrible journalist, and I, I mean, like, it was really bad. 
there's nothing to be gained by engaging with um, stuff that's so kind of low down in the discourse that it's summit to name calling. Um, I also think that when you respond to shitstorm comments, it's best to do it from a place of calmness and strength. Um, when I'm feeling really upset, uh, sometimes I can write things that are powerful, but I'm usually not making an argument that is going to be persuasive to other people. So I think it's good to sleep on it, uh, ask a friend, um, and write something. I think also being just being a woman in this space that it has to be as unemotional as possible, um, because anything else uh, you're read as like a hysterical, uh, crazy a person with emotion. All of the worst stereotypes about uh, our culture has about uh, women with feelings. Um, I think it's okay to write about your emotions. Like uh, we all have feelings. Sometimes there's a emotion uh, in the middle of a shitstorm that um, uh, you are not a person. You are the man uh, that everyone is rising up against uh, for justice. Um, and I think you can disrupt that expectation a little bit by saying, like, "Hey, I'm a flawed human. I, I want to make this thing. I'm doing my best." Um, and I really hurt my feelings when you said such and such a thing. Um, yeah, and then I think uh, having consistency of messaging is, uh, is, is important. So you put one statement on, uh, on one platform and then uh, you point all of your other social media stuff to that platform. Um, I think those would be my general tips. Uh, if somebody's genuinely been hurt or if you think that you screwed up, um, Ask a friend, ask somebody who's sympathetic, but who you trust to tell you the truth. Um, and if you've done wrong, then you do need to offer an apology and it needs to be a sincere apology, not an I'm sorry that you felt bad about X uh, apology. Um, and you need to say what actions you're taking to rectify the mistake that you made. Um, and it's okay to make mistakes, that's, that's how we learn. I think we should be incentivizing uh, failure and mistakes um, in our community. I think it, it's not a mark of shame or it shouldn't be a mark of shame. It's a mark that you tried hard. Um, yeah, that, that's all my advice. What, what are your secret tips? Well, I think I have two things. One is that if there's a shift from brewing or if it's already going, you, you have to critically look if it's part of the community that you want to engage with. Um, and, and, and just ignore it mm -hmm. or say, no, that's not true. And that's that's the, to the extent that you communicate with those channels of the community. Uh, because they are not going to stop and they're going to, they will feed upon your feedback. Mm -hmm. They will debate every word and then it's only about semantics or, you know, whatever. You might take flat for ignoring. And yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. Like, yeah. I, I posted this legitimate concern and you are not responding to me. Like, yeah, some I've had people like that, and I said, "Thank you for your feedback. Could you post it to this email address, which is the official channel, and we can take it from there?" Mm -hmm. So it's about getting getting it away from some way in public. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and the other thing is is to acknowledge that that people have these feelings. I I did a part of Shadow Escape in Brussels, and one of the participants really didn't like the game. Uh, many of many of other people really loved it, and then he posted like a review of 12 pages. And I was like, Thank you so much for this. This will help us make better games in the future. Mm -hmm. I think there's a big difference between yeah. someone who has a, has a like a negative critique and someone who's just calling you crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a, yeah, never engage with that. Yeah, I think you're right though about uh, not. Uh, feeding it too much. Like when I think back on one of the shit storms I weathered, like people made critiques and then I wrote something trying to address the critiques mm -hmm. and then that reopened mm -hmm. the shit storm debate and it went like three more months and it ruined my life for like three more months. Something that, that I do that might be useful and, and this goes back to having a team that you sort of love and trust. So like I, if you know me, you probably don't know that I'm prone to blind atavistic rage over internet comments. And I get very upset sometimes. And, and, I, uh, and I have a particular friend who, I, and I, uh, I immediately write a reply. 
I'll write a, I'll write a hateful <laughs> screen to reply, and I'll send it to a friend that I particularly love and trust. And I'll be like, here's what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. And then to my business partner, I say, please respond to this. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're done. Right? Yeah. Everybody has done the thing that they need to do. It's good strategy. And it works great for, for me. I have a friend, not a gamer, with a, the most amazing Facebook thread of all time. Uh, and it just says, post here what you couldn't post there. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been going for like, Five years, <laughs> and oh. periodically it will pop up again in my feed, and it'll be like, "What in general?" I want to do that. So I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are there ways to uh, kind of constructively iterate um, for future games, or if you have like an ongoing community, um, ways that you can kind of find the pony in the manure pile of the shitstorm, and, <laughs> and actually? make that constructive in some way? Well, I think people's feelings are usually valid. They're always valid. Uh, sometimes the thing, uh, I, I really like the example that um, Nick Fortuno, who's a game designer from New York, gave me about um, game design, which is that, uh, like, imagine you are in a restaurant and you're tasting a dish and you say, there's not enough salt. Uh, well, the cook might go into the back of the kitchen and make the dish again, but the problem wasn't that there wasn't enough salt, it's that there was too much flour. So you can, you know, I think the even hateful rage feelings can sometimes um, uh, be an indication that there is something you could improve. It might not be the thing that, um, that everybody is razzing you about. It might be like, oh, I needed to have a feedback form, or I need to hire somebody to deal with this for, for me. Um, there's usually something you can do. Yeah, the, I, think, I think it also depends on when you engage with it. Uh, there's this thing that uh, many lot uh, organizers use, it's called Week of Stories, where you they ask for you because when you're exhausted after a lot, you cannot physically engage with feedback. You can engage with people praising the thing, but you can't really engage with the stuff that's critical about it. Um, and they ask you to wait a week to to point to, to criticisms. And I understand why people need this, but I absolutely hate it. I hate it so much because it also stops the dialogue. Uh, because after a week, then people have made peace with it, and then they will not post and you not get the feedback. I understand. I, I cannot engage with it on day one either, but I just let people post it to me because I also think it's one of the responsibilities when you create something that you should be you should be ready to get criticized about what you do, uh, and then I let it go. Uh, I let I say can't engage with it right now, but let's see in a week. And then I can step back into it, and then we can have a discussion about it when the emotions have gone from from the, the criticism. And then we can figure out if it's valid or not. Right. So, I just wanted to add that I think what you're doing and saying like I'm going to engage with this at this time mm -hmm. is good for that. It's good for so many other things. Mm -hmm. Setting an expectation of how quickly a response will come yeah. can be super helpful. And I know I have a habit with work. I have a couple of different jobs at which I answer you know ridiculous amounts of email and and some other routes like Google business reviews and things like that. And is I found that the answer, thank you for your comments. We will address this within the next 48 hours. Buys enough time to maybe allow the atavistic rage to settle down, <laughs> or allow the second person to be called in to write an answer, or just for my giant pile of work because two coworkers had sick days, and I don't have any time to write anything coherent today. I'm going to have to do it tomorrow. It allows me to get that time. While the other person isn't fuming that I didn't answer yet, so like I've even I've even published on a web page like please re, you know post you know please send all comments to this email address we will respond within forty eight hours or we will respond within three days or something like that. Also, though, the not responding requires having the self control to not respond. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody has a trick. You write accountability partners. I always have a notepad next to me. Just write everything's on the notepad, and you don't ever accidentally send send. Well, like, automatic vacation reminders. 
And you, and you know how sometimes you send email to someone, they're like, I'm out of the office for the week. That would be like the, thank you for your comment. I'm taking time away from the LARP. I'll see you in a week. And, and with weekend stories, you can also ask your participants to, to document their feelings, but just if you don't send them for a week. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And don't use it as a marketing tool or web. Oh, right. I've, I've seen this happen with weekend stories. Like, went to a LARP, it was pretty shitty. They asked for weekend stories. Then three days passed, they declared it a success because everybody had written all the good stuff yeah. and started yeah. selling tickets for the next one. Right? Yeah. Oh, wow. And I was like, Oh, it's on, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have to be respectful both ways. Mm -hmm. And accountable, like if you stay 48 hours. Then you got to be Which helps me because I need deadlines or I'll put things off forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it might be good to have like a summary of like things that you're changing or feedback after, like a couple weeks mm -hmm. after the LARP. Based on basic feedback we received, like we decided to adjust these couple of things. Thank you, everybody, for or even just say like don't even tell them what to do. You decided you're not changing anything. Just being sitting now, like hey, we got a lot of great feedback, uh, positive and negative. We're taking this into consideration the next time we run it, right? Like it's to like people hear it. And in the old restaurant adage for every customer who complains, there are ten of the same complaint who didn't say anything. Yeah. So if somebody posts an angry post or sends an angry email, you might. Even if that was private, you might want to answer publicly mm -hmm. because they might have pointed out something that needs correcting, yeah. and ten other people experienced the problem but didn't tell you or didn't tell you that. We've got about ten minutes left. Are there any other like questions or topics that folks want to? What's that? What's still on your list? I mean, we've done a pretty good job. Um, we did infrastructure. We have we've got a few epic fails of communication failure. <laughs> Online engagement we talked about, communications infrastructure we talked about. Um, yeah. And so I was, I was gonna open it up. Is there anything that we kind of grazed that folks wanted to get back to talking about or any topics? Yeah. Um, in terms of free event messaging to participants, how much and how often is too much? Mm -hmm. Again, like Hamlet, uh, we do three send outs. Uh, and all of the information is on the website. So, but, but it, and it's very much tiered towards what information you need when, right? So, early on, you need to understand the game, the, the world of the, the fiction, and, and what your positioning is, and what you, we want you to do before the LARP. Um, and then it becomes more about relations and, and focus on participant to participant connections. And the third one is very much practical. You need to you need to be in Copenhagen Airport on the day this because it takes so long to go on the train to Elsinore and the workshop starts here, and you're gonna get food there, and these are the numbers for taxis and so on. So you the more you alleviate stress in that final send out for the participants so they feel safe, then they'll be better participants at the game and also feel safe there and they will trust you more. So, uh, one thing I've discovered that I haven't figured out yet is people have very different needs when it comes to that. So, that's definitely the model that I follow. There are some people who plan their travel so much farther in advance that I, it ever even comes on my radar <laughs> that they start to have anxiety about information like that, yeah. some of which has not, is not even necessarily fully final yet. Like, I can't necessarily even give you some of that information yet. But they, for their own, Sanity want to plan these things out of it, and they can then start an anxiety whirlwind mm -hmm. um, from other people who weren't thinking about those things yet either. But because they post it publicly, um, they get going. And so, I have struggled with what is considered the normal. <laughs> like, the, like, is this an unreasonable expectation that I should have this information for you seven months ahead, right? You know, or is this really the the message that should go out sixty days ahead, like? Um, like I'm, I'm thinking of, and uh, and then they feed on each other, right? In this in this community way, like literally, I was net like person A and B and C. We're not thinking about it or worried about it at all until yeah. person D suddenly like. Yeah. You know, and uh, uh, for example, with travel, that is on the website from day one. Okay. At least this is where it needs to be. It takes approximately this time. This is a link to where you can look what tickets costs and. and Okay. Then the negotiate will be put in later, but but yeah, people are very anxious about travel for some reason, like a year in advance. <laughs>
when will the train be? The train comes. The train comes. Right. Yes. Airlines don't have schedules until six months ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. Or like how am I getting to magic school at fourteen? See, I know. <laughs> I don't even know where magic school. <laughs> 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 yeah. Don't um, need to be do magic. You, do you think? Okay. So this is this thing I struggle a lot with is what Lizzie was talking about earlier with the TMI, right? Which is. My gut on a lot of this stuff is, well, I wanted to the FAQ, right? All the time it's and then you end up with this like information overload that's sort of addressed, uh, and then and then maybe I'm not communicating at all anymore because there's too much information. I think it's a, it's a user experience problem, right? and there are solutions for that. Yeah. There's, there's, there are best practices for that. It is a complicated user experience it is. It's because okay. we're talking about a bunch of different kinds of users. Right. Yeah, like understand. just the, even the question we had before about the different information needed for first time, like someone who doesn't have a background in logic versus someone that does, versus someone that has genre knowledge versus someone that doesn't, versus someone who is a good traveler. Right. Or someone who right. Each yeah. of these people have different user experience yeah. needs, and so it's it's it's, it's very it's tough. It's tough. Yeah, I'm uh, just acknowledging that it's tough is actually kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering, like, would it help to have a super detailed travel one sheet and you could give the basic information on the website? Like, everybody needs to know when the lab is, where it is, how long it goes, you know, what the accommodations will be. And then you could just have a line at the bottom, like, if you need more information, email me. And then you'd have, like, the preset uh, Google Doc or handout or something. Because it'd be yeah. Yeah. We we also do a thing where we say this is what you absolutely need to know. This is yeah. the um, yeah. the minimum, and then we have all of these things also. How much is the minimum for? <coughs> is it like a page of information? Maybe it's maybe a page. Yeah. yeah. Then you know we say maybe you should watch like one of the maybe read the play or watch the version of the play. Probably a good idea. Many people don't. You know, it's fine. Who will guide them through anyway? Right. So. Sorry, anybody in here? Please <laughs> 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 well, as an English teacher, I, the prologue of Under Shakespeare probably tells you what's going to happen. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, so you read the prologue for the first time to the students, and they were like, "But now I know what's going to happen." I, I know it's a hot topic, but I feel there's been some psychological research that shows that spoilers actually don't diminish your enjoyment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and that, just to answer your question from a different point of view, I think three is a good number. It's actually the magic number. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that's how many times I communicate to you. Like, this, is, this is the thing. Do you remember about the thing? It's the day before the thing. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much my life. And you have for your monthly events? Yes. Oh. So in, in the for monthly events, it's um, when are we going to do the thing, everybody? Okay, we decided when we're going to do the thing, and then it's the thing is tomorrow. Or even on a regular schedule, I feel also helps people not feel overwhelmed with information. So if you know you're going to have to send seven bulletins, start seven weeks before the event. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And send it out on the same day. Mm -hmm. So people are like, oh, it's my Monday. Yeah. Uh, Monday even unconsciously. Yeah. Yeah. Also, maybe you are. I think most creators are thoroughly in love with the world that they've created, but you know, don't be talking and you know, right? <laughs> you don't need all that information, right? You don't need stuff that was a thousand years before the live. You know, <laughs> stop being so much in love with your shit. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You haven't published a similar earlier yet, and that's good. <laughs> no. uh, so true. Any last questions or final thoughts? No? Well, then we have not failed to communicate this next time. Look at the bottom of